Hi, it's Sophie and Day. We are here with another Ask Sophie response. And today we're going to be talking about women in sports. Uh, this is particularly going to cover the Paris Olympics gender controversy. So let's jump right in. The question that I was asked was from a friend of mine on Facebook named Matt. And he asks, do you think trans women should be able to compete in sports with cis women? Yes. <laughs> I mean, the short answer is quite frankly, yes. In, in all regards and capacities, I do feel that trans women have every right to compete in sports with cis women. Of course, I'm going to qualify that and, and give you answers that are not just based on my opinions, but based on the actual facts as they stand. So let's do a little housekeeping before we jump into just why I feel that this is perfectly fine. Now, I know, I know in my heart that you are a good person. I know this, like you're, you're only concerned for women's welfare, especially when it comes to the boxing match with Amani Khalif and, and Lin Yu Ting. There's this real fear that if there are men in the ring with women, that they could do real harm to them. And so I, I fully understand that that's the place that you're coming from. And that's a really sweet thing. And so I'm not discounting your concerns. I just want to really go through why you might not have to worry as much as you <laughs> as you are. It's okay, like I promise. So we're going to take this whole thing in the spirit of trying to make you feel a little bit better about the decisions that the IOC made and, and why things progressed the way they did and why some of the hatred that was really, really levied at these women was unfounded. It, it's your opinion if you're on the, the, I guess, the opposing side of my arguments, it's your opinion that, you know, trans women aren't women or that they can't fight with women or that the, the women in question with the gender controversy are actually men. You know, those are your opinions. But I really want you to understand that some opinions are just wrong. And it's okay. Like if, if you are presented with the actual facts and information, then, you know, it's a, it, it's in keeping with being a good person that you adjust your opinions. And so I'm hoping that that's what we can again do today. Now, I operate from objective wrong and right. And I know that's really difficult to say because you're like, oh, right and wrong. Isn't that based on morality or based on a book or based on whatever? No, I think actually we can extrapolate out whether a, a, a claim is right or wrong very easily. So if we were to say we have an argument that smoking marijuana is fine, you know, and, and if we looked at everybody in the world doing that, like all adults of, you know, sound mind doing this thing, would the world implode? Would things you know, go to hell in a handbasket? So if everybody in the world smoked weed, you know, who could smoke weed, smoked weed, things would probably be a lot more chill. I don't think that, that everything would go to hell. But on the other hand, if we have the argument that the death penalty is a good thing, we can just kill people when we feel that they've done something egregious. If everybody in the world killed somebody every time they thought they did something wrong, then yeah, that would be a pretty bad thing. When we extrapolate out an argument to everyone performing that action, if the world continues spinning just fine, then I would say it's objectively a, a, a right or correct or okay thing to do. And if things absolutely go to hell in a handbasket again, then yeah, I'd say it's objectively wrong. So if we look at the argument of trans women, like, is it okay to be a trans woman? If every man on earth felt that he was in actuality a woman, that wouldn't change anything. No, you know, we'd have a lot more women in the world, but it's not like, you know, we would stop procreating. It's not like we couldn't free sperm. It's not like the world would die. It's, you know, there's literally nothing wrong with, with that if everybody did it. Now, if we even go one step further and said that the argument is, can trans women compete with cis women? And I say that that's perfectly fine. If every single trans woman 
wanted to box any woman who wanted to be a boxer, again, I would say that's perfectly fine. And I'll show you more specifically why it, it, basically a trans woman fighting a cis woman is just like a cis woman fighting a cis woman. It's really no different. And I know that sounds a little perplexing if you if you haven't gotten all the facts and seen all the research. So we will lay it out in my arguments today. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect, but it's essentially a maxim that we tend to collectively feel like, okay, I, I know a little something about this, so I have a, a, a much greater understanding than the reality would dictate. Honestly, it, once you start to gather more information about that topic, you tend to realize, okay, maybe I didn't know everything I thought I did. <laughs> and I want you to think back about a time that you held an opinion, learned a little bit more about it, and then realized, okay, I don't know anything at all. And I'll say, like, I thought I knew all there was to know about writing and grammar. And then I took a linguistics course in grad school, and I learned that <laughs> there's so much more to pronouns and, and synonyms and acronyms. And there's all these nuances to language that I just had no idea even existed. So I moved from that place of, you know, what I'm, I'm very articulate and I'm very well read and well spoken to being like, okay, I don't know shit about the English language. Oh my gosh. And then, you know, finally getting to a place where it was like, okay, it's just a little bit more complicated than <laughs> what we might've learned in, in elementary and middle school. So when it comes to trans women, particularly trans women in sports, and even this whole Paris gender controversy. If I'm able to move you to a place of, hey, this is kind of complicated, this is a little more nuanced, then I'll feel like my job here is done. And now if you're unwilling to make that migration, if you're unwilling to change. If you're just like, you know what, trans women are never going to, and, and those were actually men up there, you know what, then, then I don't even know why you'd want to waste your time watching this. It's going to be a very long video. <laughs> it's going to be long. And so if you're, if you're not here to gather information to help you come to a better place of understanding and empathy with these two women and with trans women in particular, don't waste your time. Don't waste my time. But if you're willing to change and move along this Dunning-Kruger spectrum, then, you know, let's keep going. And one of the things that I want to really get into is just why you may feel the way that you do, or you may have the, you know, really strongly held beliefs about women and gender roles and gender essentialism and all this stuff. There's a purpose behind that. There, There are people who enjoy and benefit from you living in a place of ignorance. And so we'll talk about that today as well. Overall, though, I'm just I'm really glad you're here. And I'm really glad that you're interested in learning more. But if you are here to, again, spew hate or be venomous about, you know, people's very real lives, hate will not be tolerated in this space. All right. So we've been in this video for just a few minutes. And I'm willing to bet that there's already going to be comments that are not necessarily in favor of what we're discussing today. And so if you've noticed that someone's commented something negative or that, you know, speaks to the fact that they probably didn't actually watch this video, I'd love for you to reply to their comment with Cornholio. I do love Beavis and Butthead, but also just I think it's a silly word. And I think that it might be a little confusing <laughs> and prompt that person to actually go back and review the video if they see enough people saying, hey, guy, this, this is silly. You should have watched it. And add a timestamp, if you like, for where we might have addressed where they obviously missed that point. So this entire question was predicated um, on a conversation I was having with two gentlemen on Facebook who were friends of mine and they were just, these are men and this is terrible. They're going to hurt a woman. And, you know, I was like, okay, okay, my guys, like, no, this, it's really not, 
that serious. It's really um, actually pretty shitty how they're treating these young ladies. And so this was all founded on the fact that the Olympics controversy in itself was just bullshit, plain and simple. And so I want to firstly talk about just why it's all bullshit. And then we can, I think, get into the argument around why trans women absolutely deserve to fight with cis women uh, in the boxing ring, not in real life. (laughs) So the Olympics gender controversy stemmed from these two women, Amani Khalif and Lin Yu Ting, being accused of being men by a boxing organization, the IBA, International Boxing Association, that they used to fight under. And they actually still fight under. They're they're still members of the IBA. Their countries are. So Amani Khalif is from Algeria and Lin Yu Ting is from Taiwan. And Lin Yu Ting is a featherweight boxer. Amani Khalif is a welterweight boxer. And they've been fighting for years. The Olympics was not their first rodeo. <laughs> they've been around for a while and they've been with the IBA for a while. So our journey with the IBA begins back in 2006 when CKU was made the president of the IBA. Back then it was called the AIBA. And he was actually making a bid to become the president of the IOC, the International Olympics Committee, back in 2014. And he botched that, didn't even get past the first round and was basically like, okay, well, I'm going to fall back to staying the president of the IBA. And he didn't do a very good job. So from 2014 through 2017, back with the Rio Olympics, he just botched so many things. He ran their money into the ground. They were like $20 million in debt. They had this whole scandal because CK Wu was like holding up their Olympics opportunities to force them to sign pro contracts. It was really crazy. So they ousted him in 2017 and then brought in Guffer Rakimov. And Rakimov was actually back when CK Wu was making his bid for the IOC presidency. He was promised at that time to become president of the IBA. So that was already, you know, rubbing everybody the wrong way because he was like, no, yoink, I I didn't make the IOC presidency. So I'm just going to stay president of the IBA. So you got this guy, Guffer Rakimov, really upset that he he didn't get to be president sooner. But finally, when CK Wu was ousted, he was brought in. The unfortunate thing about that is Gafur Rakhimov is an Uzbekistani, like, criminal mastermind. (laughs) He's like an underworld guy, like a mobster, like in the Uzbek mob. And so the IOC was like, no, no, we we can't have this because they already had such bad financial and just general governance from CK Wu. So the IOC suspended the IBA and said, you know, we're not going to let you manage or administrate any of our boxing tournaments until you guys they had this whole like multi-page multi-tier plan that they would have to do in order to basically become unsuspended and so one of those things was getting rid of Rakamov which they did so he was basically uh, gone the next year in 2019 so they didn't really make matters better for themselves (laughs) because they brought in Umar Krimlev who was like a Russian Putin lackey and so like it just it's like hey can you guys please not work with underworld crazy you know corrupt people and they were like nah that's what we're gonna do so in 2022 the IOC banned Russia because of their doping practices and also because of the war on Ukraine and the IBA didn't give a shit they basically continued to pay and sponsor fighters and fights and also I think that, that was around the time that Umar Kremlev brought the IBA's headquarters to Russia. They were actually communicating like through the Kremlin. Like this guy was like his best friends with Putin. Like it was a whole thing. So in 2023, the IBA banned Khalif and Yuting for supposedly failing gender verification tests. And the IOC said, nah, this is this is one too many straws on the camel's back and it effectively broke. So they uh, were perma banned 
And it wasn't just because of this. They, they'd also had a sponsor, a Russian sponsor named Gazprom who uh, helped them get out of their $20 million debt from CK Wu. They again, moved the, their entire headquarters and operations to Russia. They had a lot of other issues with their qualification systems, but that would include, you know, how they did their gender and drug testing. The official line from the IOC was that they stripped the IBA of their Olympic status because they had concerns about its integrity, finances, and their governance. As you can guess, Umar Krimlov was not very happy about being permanently banned. So he blames Thomas Bach in particular, who's the president of the IOC. And he's trying to basically ignore the fact that it there were so many other issues and say that they were permanently banned because they were trying to fight for women. And that's why they banned Khalif and Yuting because they believed in women only fighting f- women. And so, you know, that's it, have a listen to what <laughs> Umar Krimlev has to say about everything. He says, we will defend and uphold their rights. We stand for gender equality, for the right values. Thomas back, wait for your diapers. <laughs> and then he punches the screen. Psst. Thanks for watching, but make sure you subscribe. All right, back to the video. So yeah, not a happy camper. <laughs> Mark Adams, who was an, a spokesman for the IOC said, these two athletes were the victims of a sudden and arbitrary decision by the IBA. Such an approach is contrary to good governance. And so they were absolutely on the side of these women and really were horrified about how they went about banning these two young ladies. And so let's really move into what I'm calling the transvestigation. <laughs> now, transvestigations, I'm co-opting that word. It's actually a real fake thing. It's like a real conspiracy theory. This is a whole separate thing. You can look up transvestigations uh, at some other time. Basically, there's this whole school of thought that Every famous person you see was once the opposite gender. So like Leonardo DiCaprio and and Henry Cavill and I don't know who else, Tom Cruise, like they're saying all these people were born women and they are, they're all trans. And um, so that's, that's a real thing that people think. But I'm just saying this is a transvestigation because it, they really did go after these women and why did they do that let's have a look so i feel like we have to ask ourselves quite a few questions when it comes to how all of this went down the first question i asked is why is the top brass who are bringing all these concerns so this is george year olympus he's a greek guy but he is Umar Krimlev's like main guy. He was his toady. He was his fix it man. He brought him in as the IBA secretary general and CEO. Um, that's one person, even though it's two titles. <laughs> He's who brought this whole case in the first place. The decision was taken by the IBA secretary general and CEO on behalf of, I think, Umar Krimlev. So you have to ask yourself, Again, like, don't they have some kind of unit who does this testing? Wouldn't that have been something that would have been routine that they do? And there is. There's a Boxing Independent Integrity Unit under the IBA that's run by this guy. His name is Bernard Heinrich Velton, and he's the managing board chairman of the Boxing Independent Integrity Unit that the IBA uses for this particular thing. So why... Is this a case being brought by George Olympus for Umar Krimlev? So that's a big question I have. Um, I think he was basically a scapegoat for all this because when they tried it, well, they effectively did it. They banned these women. And then like as soon as the IOC was like, you know what, that's it. You guys are out. He was fired. Your Olympus was fired. So it's absolutely <laughs> wild how they treated this guy who was really just again a toady for a Kremlin. you also have to ask yourself what happened in istanbul in turkey in 2022 and essentially they're trying to say that these two women failed two separate tests the one they did right before the competition that they were excluded from and one in istanbul in 2022 so if they'd already had 
evidence that these women were not passing gender tests, why were they allowed to compete at all in New Delhi? It makes no sense. So that's yet another concern I had. You also have to look at who the beneficiary of these bannings is. So they're trying to say, okay, the proposal is to reinstate John James Suwanafeng, who lost to Amani Khalif. This is John James Suwanafeng. She's a very masculine looking woman. She's a woman. And I really and genuinely think that they wanted to say that they were doing all this to help John James so they'd have plausible deniability to say, oh, well, she's very masculine looking. It's not that we're targeting these women because look at her. She dresses like a man. So it, we're obviously not attacking these two women. And, and I also think that they're genuinely thinking we're kind of stupid because like, okay, Lin Yuting is from Taiwan. John Jim Suwanafeng is from Thailand. Those are two totally separate places. But I think they want to try to say, oh, it's not that, you know, she's Taiwanese that we targeted Lin Yuting. Lin Yuting is Taiwanese. And so I think she was kind of thrown in the mix and targeted to get back at CK Wu, who is also Taiwanese. And I think that their exoneration of John Jim as a Thai person, just because that wording could make it seem again like, oh, we're, we don't have anything against, you know, Asian people or Thai people. When in actuality, I think they wanted to target Lin Yu Ting just to kind of poke at CK Wu. So we have to look at then who is the real winner of all of this? Who is the actual beneficiary? Yes, the proposal was to reinstate John Jean, but also the IBA should reinstate and move up all boxers who were competing in medal contests against Amani Khalif. So who might that be? Meet Azalea Amaneva, and let's hear a little bit from her. She says, don't you think there's too much unfounded hype around you, Amani Khalif? Do you remember how you and I boxed at the World Championships in 2023 in India, where I knocked you down? I'm ready to repeat that moment and send you to the floor again to answer for all the girls that you got in the way of. Okay, Azalea. Okay, Azalea. Let's see what she's talking about. This is what she's saying when she knocked Amani Khalif down. So I want you to know Amani is in the blue. Azalea is in the red. All right, do you see that? That's her knocking her. She didn't knock her out. She like physically knocked her down. Look at this again. That's what she's talking about. But let, let's see how the rest of the fight turned out. That's right. Amani Khalif beat that ass. She won four to one. And guess what date this particular match was on? March 21st, 2023. Now, why is that such a bombshell date? Oh, would you look at that? It's only three days before the IBA banned Amani Khalif and Lin Yuting. How how interesting is that? They ratified it on the next day. And and the the competition was over March 26th. So they really rushed this through to try to get her uh basically defamed, you know, before she could do <laughs> any better in the competition. And they wanted to really salvage Azalea Amaneva's record. And here's why. Azalea Amaneva, before she lost four to one to Amani Khalif, had zero losses. So they wanted to rectify that real quick. Now they ended up making it a no contest fight. So I'm not too sure how that manifested through the competition. She didn't actually end up winning that championship. But it still fixed her record. So she now, this this is as of like yesterday, she still has an undefeated record, even though she lost. You also have to look at the fact that where does Azalea Amaneva hail from? She's Russian. So don't you find it interesting that three days after she loses, 
the Russian president of the IBA, who's already known for his corruption, would do any and everything he could to try to fix his compatriots record. I'll let you be the judge of that. So anyway, it's just the same old playbook. I really, really want you to understand (laughs) that this entire thing was a farce. It really was. And so you have to ask yourself, are you going to be a pawn? We all know that Russia has a subversion campaign against America, against democracy. And so anything they can do to sow discord, especially when it's right around an election season, and we just got all this news about how they're actively trying to subvert the 2024 election, that, you know, any little thing they can do, and this is just one part of it. So I think what's really despicable about Umar Krimlev trying to say that this is about protecting women is that not only is it to cover his own ass for all the illicit shit that he did in the IBA, it's just one more way to sow discord in the world. And so if you want to be a party to that, you go right ahead. But I choose to be a person who thinks for myself and not a pawn in the Russian subversion playbook. Moving on. I hate that all of this controversy was basically stemmed from these massive, massive, easily detectable lies. I mean, I'm looking at their own minutes. I'm looking at their own press releases. This is stuff that they put out that, you know, clearly shows that they just did this to try to protect the Russian fighter and not the and not the foreign brown person. <laughs> so I hate to, to do this, but I, I want to move forward under the premise that they are right. Let's let's say that these women really did have X, Y chromosomes. So that was their claim. According to the results of the test, they have XY chromosomes. That's what they said on March 25th. Now, ever since that day that they posted this, they've been trying to run that back and they have definitely backtracked from that sentiment. But again, they have XY chromosomes. Okay. I still think it's fine for them to fight with cis women. Let's go through it. So to, to really get an understanding of just why I'm okay with this, I think we have to have some common understanding around some general definitions. So let's talk about sex and what it means to be a male or a female. So sex is a multidimensional biological construct based on anatomy, physiology, genetics, and hormones. So this is the clinical definition, but let's break it down even more. When it comes to sex, there are two types of sex. We have genotypic sex. These are the permanent things about your makeup, like your DNA, chromosomes, and genetics. And then you have phenotypic sex. These are physical traits like your genitalia, your reproductive organs, your hormone levels, things like that. You also have secondary sex characteristics that are also phenotypic. They are physical traits typically, but they don't have anything to do with reproduction. These are things like your voice quality. If you have facial hair, you know, growing pubic hair, breast size, hip size, things like that. So we use all of these things to determine whether or not you fall into the bucket of being female or male. But sometimes it's not always that simple. And you have people who fall somewhere along the spectrum. (laughs) And those are people that we call intersex. Now, intersex people have genitals, hormones, or chromosomes, or reproductive organs that just don't fit very snugly into these male-female sex binaries. And it's something I've known about for a long time, but I didn't realize a lot of people weren't familiar with the term intersex. I want to even show you just anecdotally. I, I love this. When I was pregnant with this one, <laughs> I, you know, at our 20 week scan, when you find out the baby's sex, I actually, this is my actual blog post about it. I was wondering if she would be a boy, girl or intersex. And so I, I love that time because I, I had a lot of friends who were like, oh, what is that? And so we actually had an opening for some really great conversations. She turned out to be a little girl, obviously. But if she was intersex, I think we would have 
been in a unique position to really nurture that unique nature in her. But she's a beautiful little girl. This is her. And I just do, I do anything to show her little pictures as much as I can. I just love them. So anyway, (laughs) intersex is the 2S and the I in 2S LGBTQIA+. And 2S stands for two-spirit, which is a Native American term that describes people who, again, don't fall into the binary of male-female. These were people who were revered. It was considered a third gender. Um, And these are people who either were physically intersex, where they manifested two different organs or two different genitals, or it could be people who were androgynous or people who exhibited female qualities when they were male or male qualities when they were female. So it's a pretty wide ranging spectrum. And intersex is also wide ranging. Now, intersex traits may be visible at birth. They might appear later, or you might even never know that you were intersex, which is interesting. So if you're a a woman born with internal testes, and you never had a reason to get that checked out, you, you genuinely might not know. And there's quite a few people who fall into the category of intersex. 1.7% of live births are intersex. Now, a great deal of those are hormonally intersex, but it's really difficult to try to narrow the scope of what actually defines being intersex. People want to try to say it's it's pure hermaphroditism um, and they want to try to qualify it that way. But, you know, if you have uh, high hormone levels and exhibit very masculine secondary sex characteristics, you could still fall into the intersex category. And let's talk about that. So there's three different ways you can be intersex. One is if you have anatomical differentiation where your genitals don't match your reproductive organs, or you might have traits of both. Now, unfortunately, being intersex is not really well known and and not having the education around what it means has done so much irreparable damage to so many people. One to two live births out of every thousand receive some sort of corrective genital surgery. So that, first of all, lets us know that being intersex might be more common than we actually, you know, assume. But also, it just means that there's people who are denied the chance to choose their gender should they want to at some point. So if you remove a, a, a man's penis because you see that he has a vagina or you close a woman's vagina just because you see she has a penis and they grow to really identify more with that opposite sex. How devastating is that? How, how again, irreparably harmful is that for that person? There's a really great documentary called Every Body. And it, it includes a story uh, from a guy named Sean who had that happen to him. So it's a very real issue. And I think people need to know a lot more about what your babies could possibly be and, and really respect that. They need to be the ones to make that decision about their bodies, not you. Hey, sorry to interrupt. It's Sophie. Just wanted to ask you to like and subscribe. All right, let's get back to it. You could have the anim- anatomical differentiation hormonal differentiation. Everybody is born with androgens and estrogens. And androgens can consist of testosterone, of course, but you also have androstenedione, dehydroepi... (laughs) dehydroepiandrosterone, which is DHEA, dihydrotestosterone, which is DHT. So there's you know, a lot of different androgens. Again, the main one is testosterone, but everybody has these things. And so you can have levels that aren't commensurate with the sex you were assigned at birth. And that would make you intersex. One of the ways that that happens is with a condition called congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And that is basically when females are born producing too much testosterone. But there's also a condition called non-classical congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And that's where you're born a woman, 
but you get that testosterone push at puberty and then you start to exhibit more masculine or male secondary sex characteristics. So a majority of the people who are intersex have non-classical congenital adrenal hyperplasia and they're considered intersex, but then you have conditions like PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. I actually have it. 18 to 20% of women get it. And and one of those side effects is having high testosterone and having very masculine secondary sex characteristics like hirsutism where you get facial hair and things like that. PCOS is actually not considered intersex, um, but it's a big raging debate right now. And so it's interesting to know that if, you know, they classify things a little differently, I I might actually be intersex. I, I think the reason they don't classify PCOS as intersex is because um, not every woman who has PCOS exhibits the same conditions, whereas with NCAH, every woman who gets that has that big testosterone push. But I think only about 5 to 15 percent of women don't get that with PCOS. And so you can have very skinny just very tired (laughs) women who have PCOS, but they don't look like what that might traditionally be where you're overweight and again, have the facial hair and things like that. You also have chromosomal differentiation where you may or may not have an SRY chromosome, but present differently. Now the SRY is the Y. So when people say XX is female, XY is male, that Y is the SRY chromosome. And I just want to note that the father is who determines the baby's sex. The father is who gives or does not give or pass along that SRY chromosome, which I find hilarious when I hear men say, I want strapping young boys. And I'm like, okay, that's up to you, baby. So anyway, (laughs) just to show you just how complex being intersex can be, or just how complex sex can be. If you look at this chart, On the very left-hand side, you see some of the factors that determine sex, chromosomes, genes, hormones, internal and external sex organs, and secondary sex characteristics. And if you look at this next column over, those are people who are typically biologically female. And the far column on the right are people who are typically biological male. And everything in between are the things that can happen to push you in or out of those categories. (laughs) So there's even one that's 46XY5 alpha reductase deficiency, where you are born a typical biological female. You have XY chromosomes, but you are born with a vagina. And then at puberty, your testosterone levels kick in and are actually registered by your body at that point. And you literally grow a penis. So there's... (laughs) There's all kinds of variations that occur. So let's just look at females who are born with XY chromosomes, but who are otherwise females. So one way that you can be an XY phenotypic female is with hypospadias. And that's where you have a penis, but you actually have a slit along the bottom that makes it look like you have a vagina and that actually fools a lot of parents into thinking that their babies are girls, but they're actually boys. I'm going to show you a picture of some genitalia that exhibits hypospadias. It's just a, it's not a picture, it's a drawing, but just to let you know, like you're going to see a, some genitals here. Okay. So, so this is hypospadias and it's basically where the tip of the penis has the, the slit, but it goes all the way down to the base of the penis. So you can kind of see how if you're a baby that this could actually look like a vagina. And so a lot of people with hypospadias are raised as females and it's only later determined that they're male, but that their urethral opening is very low and that the tip of the penis doesn't necessarily connect properly to the urethra. And this is just one way that hypospadias presents. There's a lot of different ways that it could show um, in different levels of it, but this is a pretty extreme example. You also have something called mosaicism and chimera. Mosaics and chimeras are people who are born with some of their genes 
exhibiting different characteristics. So you can have some of your cells that have chromosomes that exhibit the XX signature and some that exhibit the XY signature. And they just basically make up your whole body in different patterns. It's so interesting. Um, if you're a mosaic, these cells come from one zygote, but if you're a chimera, they come from two. So typically you have absorbed a twin in the womb. It's really interesting. And so these are some of the actual patterns of construction <laughs> of people's bodies who exhibit mosaicism or chimera. Next, you have Sawyer syndrome. And these are some of the women and men from the uh, Everybody documentary, which again, I highly recommend. The Sawyer syndrome is a genetic condition where you have XY chromosomes, but you just look like a female. You have normal female reproductive organs, uterus, fallopian tubes. Some of these people can have kids, but some have ovaries that are actually what they call streak gonads. So they're, they're not necessarily testes or ovaries. They're precursors to gonads. And then you have people who have persistent malarian duct syndrome. You have different androgen biosynthesis cascade defects that can, again, make you have XY chromosomes, but mitigate how your testosterone is used when you're growing up or when you're a baby so that you come out as a female and you can have an actual vagina and again, reproductive organs. It just depends. Sometimes you're actually uh, a male in waiting, like we talked about a little bit. So that 5A reductase deficiency is one of those androgen biosynthesis cascade defects. Um, and if you go to Las Salinas in the Dominican Republic, almost 12% of the girls raised there actually turn out to be little boys around 12, 10 to 12 years old. So Gueva Doches actually means penis at 12 because it's such a common thing there. Now we're starting to see cases that happened in Papua New Guinea and in Turkey. So it's not just something that happens there, but it is a very rare thing. And it's kind of wild that this one tiny city and this one island has so many girls that, that turn into little boys. And so these are two actual Guevedoches and they're cousins and one is still living as a girl and the other one is just embracing the fact that she's going to be a boy and so she's living as a boy. Um, and the one who's living as a little girl, her mom said that she's planning to, um, you know, if she wants to live as a boy when she turns into a boy, that's perfectly fine. It's, a, it's such a common thing there. Then you also have latex cell dysfunction. And you have, uh, finally, something called androgen insensitivity syndrome, which is very, very commonly what turns XY chromosomal genotypic males into phenotypic females. This is Hannah Gabby Odile. She's a supermodel and she is an androgen insensitivity syndrome intersex person. And she's very proud of that and speaks about it, which is really, really beautiful because she's got a vagina. She's a girl. She's a woman. Um, but she just has XY chromosomes. Have a look at this chart. These are just some of the conditions that can occur from having varying chromosomes. People can be born with only one X chromosome. They can be born with two X chromosomes and be XXY. You can have three X chromosomes. There's all kinds of different conditions that determine your gonadal structure, your genitalia, and how you present. It's interesting. It's really, really interesting. All the charts that I'm showing, this one and the other one, are uh, available on sexwithsophie.com slash links. That's where I have all of my citations. And you can, again, see these a little bit more in detail. But moving on, I want you to meet my friend Bloom. <laughs> so let's have you uh, listen to her story really quickly. And especially what she has to say about this whole parish gender controversy. Hi, I'm a biological male with XY chromosomes, and if you think that I should be competing against men in sport, then you are fucking deranged. Let's say, for example, I competed in the Olympics. If you think that because I have XY chromosomes and extremely high testosterone that I actually have an advantage on anyone else, you are sorely mistaken. And that technically I have as much testosterone in my body as a really strong, healthy man. Obviously, there is no evidence of that. Yes, I have a vagina. If you were born as a woman with XY chromosome, typically means body doesn't like testosterone very much, even though the fact that it's there 
The reason why you have a vagina means that your body can't process that testosterone. How to work out, okay? I work out probably every single day. And if you think that all this muscle, soz babe, I'm literally frail. In fact, I'm more frail than a regular girl because I have brittle, frail bones because of my fucked up hormones. So I break easily. So in order for me to train to the point where I'm going to get like super strong and be able to fucking punch someone in the nose, that makes me an incredible athlete. And it has nothing to do with the stupid testosterone that my body has no idea what to do with. It just sits there doing nothing whatsoever. So shut up, I don't wanna hear any more of your discriminatory BS. Peace. Don't you just love her? Oh my gosh. Um, so this is Bloom. She is a person who has androgen insensitivity syndrome, which means, again, she has high testosterone. She has XY chromosomes, but she has a vagina. Um, she's got undescended testes. But furthermore, she's a sister and a daughter and she's a lead singer of a band and she models. Like people are freaking people, man. We're so much more than our genders it's nuts but i do love that she really goes out of her way to share her story and talk about her being intersex just like hannah and so i want you to meet somebody else with androgen insensitivity syndrome this is santi santi sandarajan now she was included in the asian games but was stripped of her medals after failing a gender test um, according to the test, it says she had high levels of male, they say male chromosomes, but it turned out she has androgen sensitivity syndrome. Now she has absolutely tried to get that, that actual test that the Asian games did using India's freedom of information laws. And they still haven't showed her exactly what <laughs> they are banning her for and they stripped her silver medal and everything. So she's got the same condition as Bloom where she has high testosterone. So the fact that she was out here meddling as, as a track and field star is insane that she could overcome having such a, a huge deficiency with her testosterone levels. As you see, it, it, it was a lot of work and they not only stripped her of her medals, but they, they ruined her life. They ruined her life. She attempted suicide. She has to dress like a man so that people don't recognize her. She's a woman. She's very much a woman. She says she's looking forward to the day she can wear saris again. They ruined her life. Poor baby. So these witch hunts, which is what they are, they're dangerous. And so we'll talk a lot more about that later. But I want to move on to reason number two, why I think it's perfectly fine for trans women to play sports and compete with cis women. So reason number two, again, let's just keep with the same thinking that the IBA was right. And these women were trying to impersonate females. In fact, that's what they said in their, in their language, in their press release about why they actually excluded them. They said, we identified a number of athletes who tried to deceive their colleagues and pretended to be women. Again, we know the truth of what they were really trying to do, but that's just egregious. Hey, do you have a question too? Ask me on social media or go to sexwithsophie.com and become a member for free. And you can ask me a video, audio, or just a text question. And I'll make sure to do a very well-researched answer just like I'm doing right now. Thank you so much. All right, back to the video. So let's look at female impersonation in sports. I want to start with Stella Walsh. She was born in 1911 to Stefania Velasovich. At three months old, her family migrated to America. So she's an American girl, but she uh, in 1932 still did not have citizenship, but she wanted to, of course, run in the Olympics. And so she did under the Polish flag and use her Polish citizenship to, to compete. She used the name Stanislava Velasovich, and she won gold medal and, and the 1932 Olympics and was really amazing. And in 1936, she competed in her second Olympics and had a, 
a really strong rivalry with a woman named Helen Stevens, who actually ended up edging her out. And so she won silver that year. Helen Stevens won gold. And we'll talk about some of the implications of that in just a moment. But in 1947, her citizenship finally came through. And so she uh, registered her name as Stella Walsh. And so she's an American citizen at this point. She got married to a guy named Olson. And so she's Stella Walsh Olson. That was only really just so she could take advantage of a loophole so she could compete in another Olympic Games, I believe. But ultimately, you know, she was married for a very short time. And then unfortunately, sadly, in 1980, she was murdered during a failed armed robbery. She had uh, just left a store from getting supplies for some foreign uh, runners who were coming over and she wanted to welcome them. Just a beautiful, sweet woman. She was a coach and she ran all her life. But when they did her autopsy, In 1980, they discovered that she had male and female genitalia. And so that was the start of a huge uh, cascade of of like, oh, my gosh, she was really a man. She was really a man. But the thing was, she she lived her whole life as a woman. She was a woman. Her tight knit community knew that she had uh, differing sex organs She even asked a friend one day, why has God done this to me? And so it wasn't an unknown, you know, she wasn't hiding per se. But again, this is one one instance where we could say, you know, there was a female impersonation going on. Another instance was with Mary Edith Louise Weston. She was born in 1905. She became an amazing shot putter and javelin thrower. So in 1924 and 1930, she, I think, won world records in shot put. 1927, won records in the javelin throw. And then in 1936, she came out as Mark Edward Lewis Weston. And so (laughs) let me read a little bit of a news article that came out about her. So it says in the summer of 1936, she began wondering about her sex. She went to a doctor. The doctor discovered that Mary had both male and female glands and organs, but that the male were gaining dominance. Two operations completed the change from female to male, and Mary became Mr. Mark Weston. And so then he talks about how he got married to his best friend. It's really sweet. And then the final line is physicians say it's doubtful that Mark will ever become a father. So... And, and, and we don't believe that he did. There really wasn't much information on his life after that. So this is case number two where, you know, this is a woman competing and then turned out to be a man. And let's look at just one more. This is Dora Ratchin. She was born in 1918 and she was born and raised as a female. And in fact, when uh, in 1919, she got pneumonia and got really sick and the doctor confirmed for her father who was like, hey, just want to triple check here (laughs) that this is a girl. And the doctor was like, yeah, you can't change it anyway. So yeah, she's a girl. And so, okay. So she's raised her whole life as a female. And so then she becomes a, a high jumper. She really falls in love with track and field and starts to compete in her high school and just loves it. Unfortunately, in 1936, with the Berlin Olympics, the Jewish high jumper that was one of three women who were supposed to be going to the Olympics for Germany, one of them, Gretel Bergman, was not chosen. I'll let you guess why. So they teed up Dora Ratchin, and so she went in 1936 and placed fourth in the Berlin Olympics. And then in 1938, she actually won gold at the European Games and won a world record for her high jump. And so we shouldn't hate her for competing. We should hate her for being a fucking Nazi, right? (laughs) But anyway, so in 1938, like a week after those games, she was at a train station And somebody was like, hey, police officer, I think there's a man impersonating a woman over here. And the police officer went and was like, hey, are you really a dude? And he was like, "Uh, you know, I don't know. I'm not. Do I have to answer that? And and the cop was like, 
yeah, you have to answer that, you know, or, or, or else I'm going to have to physically check and see. And he was like, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm a man. I'm a man. Um, and so the officers uh, re- reported that it seemed like he was intensely relieved by actually being outed. So it turns out he was a man. They actually did do a physical examination of him on on two separate uh, cases, and he has male parts. And so in 1939, in March, he officially took his father's name. His dad actually was like, yeah, give him my name of Heinrich Karajan. And he goes by Heinz. And um, so he was actually a man. So again, third case of a man who, you know, was competing as a female. And so the thing about it, though, is that Germany, Nazi Germany, (laughs) who didn't like gay people or anyone different, actually was like, okay, we don't think there's any fraud here. No one was trying to get any money from anybody. We're just going to kind of quietly sweep this under the rug. And they just, and they did. And that was kind of all you really heard of it. He wasn't reprimanded. I think he went on to like work at his dad's bar for a while. And that's really all we've heard from him. I have no other information that I could find on Heinz or his life after being outed as a man. Um, but he's, he's, he's a good looking, he's a good looking dude. So I hope he lived a, a much better life after that. So good luck to him. But let's talk about this a little bit. The whole female impersonation thing. It's just more than meets the eye in these cases. All three were intersex. They weren't trans. They weren't squarely male. So there's that. You got Stella Walsh. So we talked about mosaicism. That's what she was deemed to have. Mark Weston, we don't know for sure, but I'm guessing he had something like 5A reductase deficiency where he was born a woman. But once he hit puberty, the testosterone kicked in and his male parts again started to gain dominance. And then Heinz Rotgen definitely had hypospadias because, again, there was so much ambiguity about his vagina. When the police examined him, they said that he had a long, thick scar on the base of his penis. Somebody who examined him also said that he had a girlishly bare chest. His father said that he was worried about him living as a man because he couldn't stand up to urinate. So all of those signs point to him having genitalia that looks like the image that we saw earlier of hypospadias. There was really no harm done. Heinz Ratchin. Germany gave back the European award. They struck her world record. Um, and she was like, that's perfectly fine. I totally understand. She was even quoted to have said, I know I couldn't have competed as a woman for much longer. Mark Weston and Stella Walsh, their records and awards still stood. The Basically, the IOC said at the time that they didn't have those tests, and so they couldn't fail those tests. And so everything was perfectly fine for them to maintain their records. But what's wild is the whole act of gender verification really began with the whole Stella Walsh situation. And not because of Stella Walsh. Helen Stevens is who won in 1936 over Stella. And Avery Brundage, who was the American Olympic Committee president at the time, he later became the International IOC Olympic Committee president. But in 1936, he was like, you know, we should probably check (laughs) these women's gender because Helen Stevens sure looks very mannish and you know that's that's the only way she could have won and beat out Stella Walsh which is crazy because they're all American so you I don't know why they would want to like shoot her in the foot like that but they did they checked Helen Stevens they saw she had a vagina and so you know of course her record stood but if they had done that to Stella Walsh they would have found that she had you know, male genitalia. So it's really interesting how that turned out and that Helen Stevens is actually the one who kind of initiated gender verification as a whole. Overall, there's just no impersonation to be found. At the time of competing, they were all women. They all identified as women. And so it's not that they went in 
as men and tried to pull anything over anyone's eyes, they were actual women. And so again, let's say that IBA is right in that Amani Khalif and Lin Yuting were actually trying to, to you know, impersonate females. There's just really no precedent for that and really no evidence of that. And there hasn't been in all of history. The final thing I want to say about this is that I am a proponent of comprehensive sex education, especially sex education that's age appropriate and instituted early and often. I just feel like if these poor, poor, poor women and men had a better understanding of, you know, just basics around genitals and, and puberty and the different types of sex that are possible, sexes that are possible, I think they would have had an easier life and an easier way of understanding these very unusual and rare cases that they found themselves to be in. And I'll do a video, I think, on this in particular, because I have had questions around, hey, why do you think you should teach, you know, a five-year-old about sex? And it's like, no, no, no. Age appropriate sex education can absolutely save children from molestation and abuse and make it where they are able to relay if something has happened to them. Suffice it to say, I think these people's lives would have been so much better and and different if they had comprehensive sex education. So that's all I'll say for now on that topic. So moving on to reason number three that I think it's perfectly fine for trans women to compete with cis women. Let's again say that the IBA was right about these women having testosterone levels in a man's range. Again, now they weren't even testing for that. The IBA themselves said that the athletes did not undergo a testosterone examination. But again, let's just say that that's the issue here. Now, it's just not a smoking gun. Let's look at this chart before we move into how they test and whatnot. Now, women in general fall within the range of the first column. The low is the top of the purple line and the high for women typically is the top of the, the bar. The middle line shows people who tend to have syndromes or conditions that give them higher testosterone levels. As you can see, they still fall well within what what most sporting organizations look for when they're trying to identify whether or not somebody has too high of testosterone to compete against other women. So the again, the the bottom line that sports organizations tend to test for is the top of the purple line. And the high point where they tend to say that it's a little too high is the top of the teal line. Uh, let me just explain one more thing. So with the top of the purple line, that's for hi hyperandrogenism. So if, if you are a woman or XY genotypic but phenotypic woman, then you can compete against other women if you have, again, what's about a 500 in ball to, to L testosterone range or a about 130 NG to DL testosterone range. So that's perfectly fine if you're a woman who just has high testosterone. Now, if you are a trans woman, then you have to stay under the 1000 in mole to, to L range or about, again, maybe 400 NG DL testosterone range. So just to show that the, the bar is a lot lower for biological females and XY phenotypic females who have high testosterone than it is for trans women, which I just find to be interesting. But ultimately, <laughs> when the IOC or, or IBA even, or whoever goes to actually do testosterone testing to see if people are androgen doping or on steroids, they have ways to determine whether or not that high testosterone level is naturally occurring or if it's coming from artificial means. So they already 
can differentiate whether or not, oh, this woman has high testosterone or, hey, this person might be doping. That's something they already do. There are common conditions that can cause women to have high testosterone. So we talked about NCAH, we talked about PCOS, but you could also have a tumor on one of your glands. Or again, you could be intersex where you have testes that are pumping more testosterone through your body or again, hormonally intersex. So there's a lot of ways that you could trip this test. Now, when it comes to treatments, once you are determined to have high testosterone, you could do something as simple as taking birth control pills. You might need a a stronger hormone therapy. Or if, again, you have like the streak gonads or testes, you can have surgery if you need to, to um, remove the thing or the tumor that's causing you to have high testosterone. So there are ways to mitigate this if you choose or if there are standards in place that you want to meet. And so just to clarify, I know that there are differences between men and women. And I know that testosterone is one of the driving forces behind those differences. But I find it really disgusting that some people who want to argue against trans women or or stay on the side of ignorance with this whole gender controversy thing, I find it so disgusting that they want to fall back on assuming that people who disagree with them are stupid or even that they start to promote violence. So I want to read you the actual full question that I was asked. Yes, I was asked, do you think trans women should be able to compete in sports with cis women? But they continued with, if so, let's do a little experiment. You can punch me in the face five times with everything you got and I'll punch you just once and let's see how that works out. Like, okay, (laughs) why is there this assumption? Not only that, I don't realize that men have more power, can hit harder, have more muscle mass and whatnot. Like, of course I know that. And I think people who would agree with my arguments know that. But it's just why then go to this place of, of inciting violence or, or, or even instilling that as the alternative? Like either you really truly believe this or you're going to let me harm you it's disgusting and so it's not just him like I actually saw this article when I was doing some research how to punch women in the face and get away with it by Reverend Stuart Campbell (laughs) so it's not just them but I just I just find it odd so it's it's not like I don't understand that there are differences between men and women or people who have higher testosterone levels or not. So let's just move forward (laughs) and talk about the differences. So when it comes to men and women in sports, people with higher testosterone absolutely have increased muscle mass, increased strength, improved recovery, better endurance, lower body fat. They tend to be more aggressive and competitive. Now, the thing about that is you can have high estrogen levels, and that also is an indicator of aggression, um, which is interesting. But uh, of course, testosterone also helps with bone density, like we learned from Bloom, and it enhances your power output. So if you look at the levels that are typical with men, it's a, it's a huge range. So anywhere from like 300 to almost a thousand uh, in moles, to L's and about 250 to 900 NGDL. I don't know the conversion chart of those very well, but as you can see, most men have a huge range of, of their testosterone levels. And, and so as you'll see, even if you are a woman competing with high testosterone levels at a man's level, you could still fall within the range of acceptability for most sporting competitions. So let's have a look at just how some of these differences show up in sports. So again, men have increased strength, speed, and explosive power, but it doesn't mean that they're the best and going to be better at everything. Females actually have an edge on men when it comes to sports that require endurance, flexibility, and balance. So it's not a shoe in So we talk about women who have high testosterone and how they benefit from that. 
But what about people like Bobin Marjanovic, who is extremely tall, has massive hands, which make him the perfect basketball player. <laughs> you have Miguel and Duran. He's got huge lung capacity, which helps him with his cycling. Rafael Nadal is ambidextrous, but he favors his left hand, which gives him an advantage in tennis. Ero Mantiranta has a mutation as his erythroprotein receptor gene, EPOR gene. So it makes him have twice as much oxygen capacity in his blood cells. So that helps a little bit when it comes to cross-country skiing, I would think. Then you have Matthias Schlitt. He has Klippel Trenani Weber syndrome. So that makes it where um, some of his muscles are enlarged. So as you can see, the arm on his baton side is, is considerably larger. And guess what he does for his sporting profession? That's right. He is an arm wrestler and he's very, very good at it because of this additional muscle mass. You have Brady Ellison, who is a world-class archer because he's got perfect 2010 vision. Dean Carnazes has a higher lactic acid disposal rate than most people, and so he can run and have higher endurance than most. Ian Thorpe has size 17 feet, so he's like a living paddle boat. <laughs> and then you have Michael Phelps, who's got all of those things just about. He's got the huge limbs. He's double jointed. He's got high lactic acid disposal rates. He's a beast. Crazy arm span. So he's got incredible genetic advantages to make him the world-class swimmer that he is. So just looking at that, we now have to confront this sort of double-edged sword of genetic advantage. So it's sad because we could say, oh, we chastise these women for having natural high testosterone, but not these men or people who have these other genetic advantages. But sports aren't segregated by height, arm span, gene mutation. They're segregated by gender as things currently stand. But on the other hand, men aren't tested for their natural testosterone levels. So I didn't show LeBron James, but I'm willing to bet that he's got the higher end of the spectrum with testosterone, why don't we separate men who who might want to play in a different division if they have less testosterone than a woman might? So, you know, it, there's still a level of hypocrisy here that I think we need to address or look at. My baby had enough of my shit, but uh, I appreciate you for sticking around and continuing to listen. Thank you. So give us a like if you're enjoying everything so far. All right. Thanks. Back to the video. Okay, I'm back. I'm sorry. It was really hot in here. <laughs> so I just put I just put day down. So just to pick up where we left off, we were talking about some of the natural advantages and genetic advantages that people have when it comes to sports. But there are other factors that come into play that aren't natural advantages, but are advantages nonetheless. Other factors like money, where if you are able to afford a sailing rig and or golf clubs and country club memberships and things like that, then you're going to have advantages in those sports as opposed to people who don't. If you live in a place like sub-Saharan Africa where there's not a lot of Olympic-sized swimming pools, that might be a challenge. Or if you live in a country that doesn't have a lot of uh, mountainous regions for you to do a lot of uh, winter Olympic sports, that could hinder you in some ways. Or for instance, like you um, are a African American and you weren't able to actually go to some of these country clubs for a very long time. You have historic and generational knowledge when it comes to some of these sports that we didn't have access to. There was even a whole campaign to eliminate community pools once they were integrated. So there's a lot of privilege that comes with some of these sports that black people couldn't even do. And I'm sure that is replete around the world. So yeah, there's plenty of ways that we could start to try to shore up some of these disparities in sports. And it's not only to do with testosterone levels and gender. But I know, again, that testosterone, when it comes to this conversation, 
is really the primary consideration. I honestly feel like that's the thing that, yeah, if we're going to talk about what makes a difference between men and women, th- this is the conversation and this is where it needs to be had. But it's not as simple as saying if you're at this range or if you're under a certain threshold, it just doesn't work like that. Like we talked about with androgen insensitivity, there's different levels to that. So you could have a lot of testosterone in your body as a female and it not do anything to you. Or again, you could be a male with very low testosterone and you might not be getting the advantages that your counterparts might. It just depends. So there's really no magic line or magic threshold. But it's, it's understandable that we have to operate within the realm of knowledge that we currently have and just continue to do more testing and more research in this area. So I may not be happy with all of the regulations and guidelines that exist around testosterone levels, but you know, it's it's better than nothing at this point because again, we do see real differences in how testosterone levels affect human beings. Now, the thing about it is having higher testosterone isn't this surefire guarantee though. So if we look at Amani Khalif and Lin Yu Ting, who are the subjects of all this uh, high testosterone debate, it's not like they made them these big, huge, bulky dudes, you know, they're still feather and welterweight fighters. <laughs> and they didn't even like win every single bout that they had. Amani Khalif has had nine losses. Lin Yu Ting has had 14 losses. So you would imagine that if having high testosterone was this be all end all, that they would just be powerhouses knocking everybody out. And that's just not the case. So either again, they didn't have high testosterone or if they did, it really didn't make it this surefire win. Now let's look at the other side of this coin too, because even highly successful women who have high testosterone don't necessarily lose their edge like you would expect when they do buffer down their levels. So let's look at Castor Semenya, who is amazing. She's a South African runner who just wrecks shop, for lack of a better term. So let's look at her literal track record. She is just gold, 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 first place, first place, first place. And then the IAAF formalized their testosterone policy, which she adhered to. So for years, she actually took medication to lower her testosterone ranges so that they were under that 500 inmol to L range. And look at what happened. Nothing. <laughs> like she still wrecked shop. So it's not this be all end all determining factor of whether or not you will or won't succeed in sport. So again, I do understand testosterone does make a difference, but I think that the ranges and levels either need to be re-evaluated or continue to have research done on them, or things just need to be taken on a case by case basis moving forward and perhaps more privately than what we're done for a lot of women, including Castor Semenya. But let's just move on to reason number four that I think that trans women are perfectly fine to compete with cis women. And let's stay with this line of thinking that if the IBA was correct, and let's say Amani and Lynn are trans women, and let's say that they're right about that, because that seems to be a thing that people are saying about them, which is not true. They are not trans. But if they were. Again, I would still be perfectly fine with them competing. Are you a trans woman? Are you a trans woman who's an athlete? I love your thoughts on this and and to know if this is helpful uh, for you, especially because we're talking about you. I don't want to talk about you without you. So leave a comment or let me know and be sure to go to sexwithsophie.com and register as a member so you can also write to my members on the forum. Thanks. Before we move into the trans discussion let's let's baseline some terminology so let's talk about gender for a few minutes to really understand and make sure we're on the same page the the definition of gender is that it's a socially constructed concept that encapsulates the roles behaviors activities and attributes that a given society considers appropriate for women men girls and boys 
So this is all socially constructed, imaginary, made up shit, basically. <laughs> it's very different from sex, which is the physical and, and actual genetic and chromosomal and, and uh, phenotypic expressions of your sex. So gender is this whole separate thing that's just a social construction. To move forward into that, a gender schema is the way that we as children even start to understand and organize the information that we're receiving about gender and about these social constructs. So the gender schema is, is a individual understanding of the social construct of gender that we develop as children. And so I want to show you a chart that that I think is just beautiful. It's not the first of its kind, but I like this one. It's by Just Flint is Fine. Um, I saw it on Instagram and I love it. So first of all, gender includes terms like woman, man, cis, trans, gender fluid, non-binary. These are all terms that describe gender and different gender expressions. But sex is really male, female, intersex. That's, that's kind of it. <laughs> so, so gender is, a, is, again, social construct, but it's a much broader spectrum. And if we look at this chart, let's say that you're 100% woman. You feel like you are woman and your gender schema of woman is this. And that's in the 1A category. If it's man, you're down in 7G. That's you're all man. So that's your gender schema for man is that now people who fall into the middle ground of that they feel they could be either men or women they're androgynous however they tend to sort of play with and mix gender in their minds they would be considered non-binary so if you don't fall within that black or white realm of man woman you could be considered non-binary now if you're somebody who moves between being man and woman, you would be considered gender fluid. If you're someone who doesn't really ascribe to either of those things, you would be considered a gender. And in fact, after you listen to the rest of this presentation, have a listen to my Sex with Sophie podcast episode on asexuality. My guest, Pamela, is asexual, but she also identifies as an agender female. Like she presents and looks like a girl and so she understands that being a woman is what people assume she is but internally she doesn't really feel that she is a gender at all it's just a wonderful conversation and if you want to learn more about asexuality a gender a romanticism things like that have a listen it's spectacular she's such a beautiful person so gender this is gender in a nutshell so Gender identity is how we as individuals feel about how we define and internalize our genders in relation to the gender schemas of our assigned sexes. And so somebody who is transgender has an internal sense of self that misaligns with the gender schema of their assigned sex. So let's look at that in you know, a real life example. So if you were born with the genotypic and phenotypic characteristics of a woman and you were raised a woman, raised a little girl, raised as a female, and that's how your gender expression is and you, you, you show up, people would look at you and the societal construct of woman is what they would apply to you then you would fall into the, the woman side of the spectrum. But inside, in your mind, internally, you know that you are a boy, you are a man, then you are considered transgender. So again, if you look like a woman or you are assigned female at birth or you um, started life <laughs> as, a, as a little girl, but that's just not who you are, then you would be transgender. So that's kind of what that looks like on this spectrum. So if the gender schema of your assigned gender is far away from what you know your gender identity is, then you are considered transgender. 
And it, it doesn't matter if you do anything about that. It doesn't matter if you now, again, you want to be a man and it doesn't matter if you dress masculine or still dress feminine. It doesn't matter if you have some sort of surgery or hormone. It doesn't matter what you do. You are transgender. And so if you are a man and your gender identity is man, you are a trans man, period. You're transgender man. If you then go about changing your gender expression to help you fit in with the societal constructs of gender so that, you know, people start to associate that and, and you know, call you by your correct pronouns and things like that, then that can help to affirm your gender identity, but it does nothing to change the fact that you are a man, period. And so let's look at one more aspect of being trans that I want to dig into a little bit here because it applies <laughs> very nicely with my argument, I will say. Um, so let's look at the definition of sex again. Now, when it comes to neuroscience, this is the definitive textbook on neuroscience. Gender is a neurosocial construct and a societal construct. But if we look at sex, check out this line. It says, think of genotypic sex as largely immutable. In other words, you can't change your genes. You can't change your chromosomes. But phenotypic sex is modifiable by developmental processes like the guevidoches, uh, hormone treatment, and or surgery. And so this is the, the definitive work on neurobiology telling us that sex is changeable. So I know that transsexual is a term that's a little bit of a slur, it's something that is thrown out as a negative. It's kind of an old school way of talking about being transgender. But I really want to co-op that. I really want to, you know, take it back. Because if somebody actually goes through HRT or has bottom or top surgery, they're, they're actually changing their phenotypic sex. So I would say you are transsexual. You are actually changing your sex to be female or male. So I absolutely think that we should, again, take that word transsexual back. And to do so, I think we should absolutely define it now as someone who alters their phenotypic sex characteristics to more closely align with the schema of their gender identity. Again, if we were to have someone who is transsexual, trans, who does the the actual physical phenotypic changes to turn themselves outwardly into how they identify inwardly, I would say that that's a transsexual person. And I don't have a problem with them competing in sports with people of the same gender that they are now trying to physically be more akin to. So let's now talk about trans women in sports now that we have a solid understanding of transsexuality and transgender concepts. So again, Amani Khalif and Lin Yuting are not transgender. They are not transsexual. And in fact, their birthplaces actually present two totally separate reasons as to why we know they're not. Because in Algeria, it's illegal to be trans. And so there's no way that uh, um, Amani Khalif could be trans because they're, they wouldn't even acknowledge that in Algeria. Also, Amani Khalif had to sell scrap metal just to afford her trip to the Olympics. And so even if Algeria allowed it, I highly doubt she could have afforded the surgeries or, or treatments to become trans. And then on the flip side, Lin Yuting is from Taiwan where being transgender is perfectly legal. So if it's legal and you don't do it, then you're obviously not trans. If it's legal and they recognize it and it shows up nowhere on her documentation, she's obviously not trans, but I digress. I also just don't understand this weird obsession with genitalia. Like, because again, having a penis makes no difference. Now, it, 
they don't have penises. I, I, the gentleman who asked the question in the first place sent me these pictures that were supposed to be smoking guns about them having penises. Just a, a quick aside, I hate to even address this because it's so dumb, but the Olympics allows for growing protection for women. And so e- even if you were trying to say that they had these weird bulges, the uh, Angela Carini has one too. So <laughs> it's just, it's just silly to even point this out as not being a thing. But again, we're taking the tact that they're right. Everybody's correct. So again, if they, even if they had a penis based on all the stuff that we talked about so far, that's not the operative thing that makes you have a difference in your fighting capacity as a boxer. It would primarily be the testosterone thing we talked about. So having a penis just, it really makes no difference. But I just don't understand this weird obsession with genitalia. Another thing that's really kind of fucked up is that the IOC had guidelines around trans women from like 2003. um, And it, it, they didn't change them until 2016. uh, But these guidelines stated that if you are a trans woman, you had to fall within certain testosterone levels, but you also had to have bottom surgery, which is horrendous. Now these are, again, these are guidelines, but you pretty much, if you want to compete, you have to follow these guidelines. So trans women who had no gender dysphoria, uh, were fine having penises, were forced to undergo surgery until 2016. So it's just, that's kind of messed up. And so I like that with more knowledge, we do see strides and improvements in how we treat people and treat trans women and treat hyperandrogen or high testosterone females. There's still a long way to go, I think. But again, transgender people are allowed to compete in the Olympics if they have their testosterone levels below a certain threshold. The fact that there are regulations in place, there are constraints and and thoughts behind how people can safely interact with each other. You know, I'm all for that. And so it's just yet another reason why I'm perfectly fine with trans women competing, because there are so many measures that are taken to ensure that they're not going to harm someone that they are operating at the same level as women. But what I think is kind of messed up, though, is that female to male transgender people don't have any restrictions. (laughs) And so again, I think that if we you know, we had testosterone testing for everybody, wouldn't that make it safer for the trans men who want to compete in sports? (laughs) So anyway, um, yeah, I just feel like there's also so much information now. And so these are the findings of a recent study called Strength, Power, and Aerobic Capacity of Transgender Athletes. So it's a cross-sectional study. And the long and short of it is that transgender women athletes demonstrated lower performance than cisgender women. And just to show even more specifically, I'll read this section to you. It's a lot, sorry. Um, But compared with cisgender women, transgender women have decreased lung function, increasing their work and breathing. Regardless of fat-free mass distribution, transgender women performed worse on the counter movement jump than cisgender women and cis men. Although transgender women have comparable absolute O2 max values to cisgender women, When normalized for body weight, transgender women's cardiovascular fitness is lower than cis men and women. So it's not like, again, people who used to be male, but now have lower testosterone levels than cis women or than cis men. It's not like they are are out here, you know, benefiting from having had been men. So again, just confirms what I'm saying. I I just have no problem with trans women, especially transsexual women who are changing their body to more closely align with cis women that they compete against. Yeah, I have no problem with that. Are you a clinician, therapist, or somebody who works with trans women? I would love your comments. Go to sexwithsophie.com and register as a clinician and let me know. That way, anything you write on or leave a comment on will indicate to everybody who's watching that you are a specialist in your field and you know what you're talking about. So do it now. Go. Sexwithsophie.com. Thanks. All right. 
back to the video. So now I want to introduce you to some trans women athletes because I think they were these wonderful pioneers for women's rights because a lot of the things that we do to make accommodations for them actually benefit all women. So the first person I want to talk about is Danette Kubik. And <laughs> I have an asterisk b- beside him because he's trans, um, but he's a trans man. But when he competed, he was a woman. So he was he competed as a woman, did amazing, and then became a trans man after that. They also kept his records in place because, when, again, when he was competing, he was a woman. But I just, I just love his story. And I love that this is 1935 we're talking about. <laughs> and yet, you know, people act like trans or being trans is this new thing. I found an old video clip. I just think he's so handsome. Uh, so check him out. He says, do you have a girlfriend? And he says, yes, I know her. She's very beautiful. Uh, the guy asks, will you marry her? He says, of course. And then he says, well, he has a girlfriend. He's going to marry her. <laughs> it's just silly. But there's like a, a whole uh, reel and he's like shaving and stuff. It's really cute. So that's our first trans person <laughs> that we'll talk about. But then we jump ahead to 1976. And this is uh, what is considered to be the first trans woman athlete. And this is Miss Renee Richards. And she was a tennis player who uh, played tennis as a man for a long time. And then she had sex change, which again, I call a sex change because she had the actual HRT and, and operations to live her life as a woman. And in 1976, she came out to compete as a woman. In 2013, we have Fallon Fox, who's an MMA wrestler. What do you call them? Fighter? MMA fighter? 2015, Hannah Mountsey, who is a rugby player. 2017, Andrea Yearwood. She's a track and field star. She's a student. 2019, my girl, Nyla Rose. I love AEW wrestling. And so I got to see her live one day, which was amazing. Um, but she's a wrestler and she's fantastic. You have CC Telfer, who's track and field. And then you have Gabby Tuft in 2021, who just re-entered the ring. This is what she used to look like. She's just now hitting the ring again. She's a wrestler too. And let me tell you about Gabby Tuft. Gabby Tuft is my girl. Like, I love her. She is just an authority on PCOS. And she she's a trans woman. So, I mean, the fact that she's got the most accurate and helpful advice I've ever seen about PCOS, just because she's done the, the homework and research and talked to so many women. She's amazing. So she's a coach. And I, I highly recommend you looking her up if you have PCOS or if you're just interested in a really cool lady. We'll talk about Laurel Hubbard for a second. She is a trans woman who does weightlifting. And she was featured in the most recent Olympics. And then the one before that, I think is was her first debut as an actual trans woman athlete. And so she fell into that category of having to be tested for her testosterone to be under a certain level, which it was. She didn't place, but I'm just really proud of her for competing and she did a really good job. And then also, yeah, we have Leah Thomas, who's um, well known for being a trans swimmer. They, They did a lot to bar her from competing, which I think is horrible because again, if you're able to keep your testosterone levels at whatever you know, level your organization deems, I don't see why you shouldn't be able to participate. Again, I don't agree with how those levels are determined, but I think those measures are in place for good reason. And if people can adhere to them, then again, I have no problem with trans women competing. But let's move on to why I think transphobia hurts all women, all people, if you ask me, I just think it's, it's a harmful thing for even men and women who are transphobic to have in their hearts you know like it's it can't be good for your stress levels (laughs) to walk around just hating on folks who you don't even know but anyway yeah reason number five that I am for trans women competing is because being transphobic is is dangerous I mean first of all let's just 
take a step back. I really want you to just put yourself in a trans woman's shoes or a trans person's shoes. Let's say you're a woman listening to this and you're a cisgender woman. You were born and raised a woman. Now imagine that you know you're a woman. Why do you know you're a woman? How do you know you're a woman? You fall into all the same social constructs that you've built, the gender schema that you've built around what it is to be a woman and you fit those. Now imagine that you don't. Imagine you're still in the same body that you have, but that inside you feel and just know that you are different than the sex that you are presenting to the world or that you were assigned at birth. Like really put yourself in somebody's shoes who has to walk around feeling that level of uncomfort. Um, I've had a, a trans friend say that it feels like you were walking around with spiders walking under your skin. Like it's, it's a horrible feeling. It's called gender dysphoria. And, and it's, it's really a dangerous thing. People commit suicide all the time because societally, especially, they're not granted permission to be who they are. Transphobia sucks. Yeah, let's talk about some of these gender witch hunts that have occurred and just how terrible they've been. All of these women identify as women. Some were uh, found to have XY chromosomes. Some were found to have mosaicism. Some were just women. <laughs> but they all were persecuted. And this, this is not a definitive list. But the very first instance that I have seen recorded of people accusing a woman of being a man and that that's why they are successful was in 1928 with Kinue Hitomi. She's a Japanese runner. The 1928 Olympics won a gold medal and immediately was like, oh, well, she's, she sure looks like a man. She must be a man. It's fucked up. She's not a man. And in fact, she, she died very early because she really pushed herself way too hard. She ran too many races in too many countries too close together and they didn't really give her a chance to rest and recuperate. And she died of pneumonia at 24 years old, 24. So, I mean, just a very short life riddled with accusations that were unfounded. She was even like at one point, like, look, I'll show you my vagina. I don't care. They, they still continued to throw all these allegations toward her. It was terrible. Let's move on to Babe Didrikson Zaharias. Now, this girl is badass. She competed in uh, basketball, football, tennis, golf, running, javelin, as you can see here, pole vaulting, everything. Whatever she did, she aced it. She was the best at it. And so, of course, you can do that. You can't be a successful woman in sports. <laughs> Not in 1932. So they accuse her of being a man. Helen Stevens, like we talked about with her race with Stella Walsh, was accused of being a man. She's a woman. So in 1964, Arena and Tamara Press were track and field stars. They got really fed up with the misogyny in the sports world. So they started, I think, a, a, a couple of different clubs that were female-led uh, athletics organizations and were vilified for it. They were accused of being men, their sisters. In 1967, Awa Bukowska was accused of being a man. Of course, uh, we all know Martina Navratilova was accused of being a man, had a song written about her, about her manly handshake or something stupid. 1981 was when we first started seeing those accusations levied toward her. 2009, Castor Semenya, who we talked about, accused of being a man. Turns out she has XY chromosomes. And high testosterone levels. And for years, she did mitigate her testosterone levels, but it didn't even make a difference. And she said it was making her very uncomfortable and she just wanted to live in her own skin. So now she still competes, but she only competes in the events that don't require testosterone testing. She's contested these decisions with the CAS and the IAAF. And, and I think they're taking it to some new international court system, which is great. So I hope she keeps fighting that fight. In 2014, Duty Chand was accused of being a man. With genetic testing, they determined that she too had XY chromosomes, but she's a woman and is a phenotypic female. So again, just 
unfounded attacks in 2017 serena williams started to get those accusations that she's a really a man she how she's so muscular this and that she literally just had her second child so i mean <laughs> she's not a man in 2019 amina tusaini was accused of being a man i think she also has hyperandrogenism um and she may have xy chromosomes as well but again she's a woman 2021 Brittany griner who is all woman She's got plenty of pictures to prove that. <laughs> um, but Brittany Griner is a woman and she was accused of being a man. She's very tall. She's a basketball player, but she's a woman. Even just this year, Alana Mayer, who's a rugby player, has just gotten all kind of criticism for her masculine body and they called her a man. She's a woman. So yeah, it's pretty terrible. Let's take a look at this magazine article from 1937. 1937. It says, is this a man or a woman? And this is one of the first like documented attacks on our dear friend, Helen Stevens, who we talked about from the Stella Walsh situation where she was accused of being a man because she, she beat her. This is 1937. And now look at what they levied against Castro Semenya in 2009. Could this women's world champ be a man? This is Time Magazine, y'all. <laughs> like, what the fuck? Like, like, can we move ahead from this misogyny after 70 years, please? So anyway, the, you know, you have these people out here, men who tend to champion or, or act like they're championing women's rights when they say, oh, these are men, they should fight against men. Those are what we call white knights, like they're trying to come in and champion women even though no woman asked them to and then you have people out there like jk rowling who are what are called TERFs. that stands for trans exclusionary radical feminists so like again how can you be protecting women when you're so ignorant about what actually constitutes being a woman that you would attack other women so again even if somebody is trans you know, they're a woman because gender is societal imaginary construct. So if somebody says they're a woman, they're a fucking woman, period. But the fact that Amani and Lynn are not trans and still had all this hate levied toward them, like it's it's dangerous. So let's look at some of the, the hate that was thrown their way and, and talk about how stupid it is now that we collectively know that we've gone through the research and the data that they're not men. And that these people's strings are being pulled by Russia. Congratulations. Uh, we got J.D. Vance, our vice presidential nominee. He reposted a tweet from Charlie Kirk that said, Enough of the gender insanity and the pandering to avoid hurting someone's precious feelings. The Olympics just allowed a biological man, Amani Khalif, to pummel Italian Olympian Angela Carini. And we have our Vice presidential nominee, J.D. Vance, talking about this is where Kamala Harris's ideas about gender lead to a grown man pummeling a woman in a boxing match. This is disgusting and all of our leaders should condemn it. Again, calling her a man. She is not a man. And J.K. Rowling, turf master general up here talking about could any picture sum up our new men's rights movement better? The smirk of a male who knows he's protected by a misogynist sporting establishment enjoying the distress of a woman he's just punched in the head and whose life's ambition he's just shattered. You have Elon Musk retweeting where Riley Gaines said, men don't belong in women's sports. Stand with Angela Carini. Let's get it trending. He says, Elon Musk, absolutely. Donald J. Trump. He says, I will keep men out of women's sports. This is a former president of the United States and a presidential nominee. Now we have Logan Paul, who is a, a MMA and some YouTube celebrity guy, but like has millions of followers, says 
This is the purest form of evil unfolding right before your eyes. A man was allowed to beat up a woman on a global stage, crushing her life's dreams while fighting for her deceased father. This delusion must end. Like, what about Amani Khalif's dreams? She's not a fucking man. It's crazy. And then finally, J.K. Rowling again talking about what will it take to end this insanity? A female boxer left with life-altering injuries? A female boxer killed? When you're, do whatever it takes. Ruin as many people's lives. So long as you can make a name for yourself as an investigatory journalist, no matter how many friends you lose or people you leave dead and bloodied along the way, just so long as you can make a name for yourself as an investigatory journalist. So as you can see, they got so much hate. So we talked about all those women who had the trans witch hunt happened to them and and Amani Khalif and Lin Yu Ting are just the the most recent recipients of it and it's awful it's awful I'm a woman like I'm a woman I don't think I'm solidly in the corner you know because I have PCOS I get hair on my face I, it was hard for me to have a baby for a long time I felt very unfeminine because of that. you know but I'm a woman and I just, I can't imagine how that would feel if somebody said, you're a man, you must be a man. Like, what the fuck? That's, ugh. I feel so bad for them. I really do. But there's, there's just, it's dangerous. Like, it's dangerous. Um, And so if we look at then just the fact that gender segregation as a whole, it stems from misogyny, not from these people actually being concerned about females and women one of the latest examples of that was in 1992 when Zhang Shan a Chinese woman won for the skeet shooting and the very next Olympics suddenly they no longer have co-ed or mixed gender shooting but the thing that sucks about that is that in 1996 they they separated the sport but didn't have enough women to compete. So Zhang Shan couldn't even compete in 1996. She had to wait a whole nother four years to compete again, which is insane. It's insane. But what's wild is this is not the first time that exact same thing happened. <laughs> so in 1976, Margaret Murdoch, she actually, um, this is how messed up this is. She tied a man, a Lanny Basham, she tied with him for shooting and they were like, nah, you're not going to share a gold. Fuck you. You're gonna, we're going to do a, a tiebreaker. And so she lost the tiebreaker, unfortunately. But L Lanny Bassam is a G and he like brought her up onto the podium so that she could share in the gold medal with him. Um, but she, you know, technically did win silver. And then like on the second Olympics after that, they suddenly had men's and women's shooting so <laughs> so it's not even the first time that that happened and now i i also want to look at the whole picture here like like it is way more complicated so the thing about the zhang shan situation is that it, it, the separation was recommended i think in 1990 or sometime before she won but that it wasn't to be instituted until 1996. But I still call bullshit on that because if they were trying to separate it because maybe there was some disparity in how women performed, I think that would have been blown out of the water with a woman winning gold. Also, all this testing that people are called out to, to do is ad hoc. It's just, hey, hey, you look like a man or I've had a, a complaint that you are a man. And so now we have to put you through all this very embarrassing and public testing about whether or not you actually have XY chromosomes or high testosterone or whatever the case is. So it's just absolutely arbitrary that these women are called out for being a man. And again, it's just, it's so, it's just mean. It's so mean. And uh, as we saw with like Shanti, it can ruin people's lives. It's awful. And it also tends to happen very, very frequently to people of color, to women of color. <laughs> to, to say that, hey, because you don't fit the, the white Eurocentric ideal of what femininity is, 
you must be a man. Like, ugh, <laughs> that's terrible. I want you at sexwithsophie.com. <laughs> so we can continue these conversations. Come on. All right, back to the video. Again, a lot of those witch hunts and attacks were levied toward white women, but they're, they're white women who looked more masculine. And then more often than not, they were towards women of color. But also the, the, the homophobia is just, is really real here. Like, oh, because you look masculine. Again, even as a white woman, you look masculine or present in a masculine fashion, suddenly you're a man. It's just not true. In fact, let's look at this real quick. The women here with asterisks on their names were openly gay or bisexual. And this is all the way back in 1932. Babe Didrikson was married <laughs> and then later in life had a, a long time relationship with a woman. So like this is this again, nothing new, nothing new. But the fact that Babe Didrikson Taharius was like very, very much about living her masculine life, you know, suddenly she's a man. It's not, it's not, it's not cool. Same with Helen Stevens. Helen Stevens is, is, is a lesbian. Uh, Martina Navratilova is a lesbian. Castor Semeni is a lesbian. D.T. Chan is a lesbian. Brittany Griner is a lesbian. So, you know, the fact that these women present in a non or atypical feminine way it doesn't suddenly make them men and so i'd love to share this brief clip of my friends who were guests on my sex with sophie podcast for my black lesbians episode because they talk about this exact thing in the black community they call like the more dominant partner a stud, stud. stud or if you dress a specific way they automatically assume that you're a stud right and when it comes to studs they feel like all studs want to be men right and that is not the case right. they may do some things that are masculine mm -hmm. but that's i feel like that's just due to them being a tomboy anyway this is how they grow up but behind closed doors i'm with a woman yeah. You know, I'm not trying to replace the males that I dated with her right. just because she dressed and appears a specific way. She is a woman right. behind closed doors. I love women. I feel like I take control of things a little bit more than she does in certain scenarios. Mm -hmm. But I love my breasts. I love my body. I don't. I don't <laughs> want to be a man. I don't want. <laughs> no, I don't want to be. You know, I don't want any male parts. I love being a woman. I just well, like women. And so, yeah, as you can see, like. Just because you're a lesbian, especially if you're a mask lesbian, it's not that they're trying to be men. They just like presenting that way. That's their gender identity. That's their gender expression. And it's beautiful. And so, you know, moving on, uh, these accusations have real effects. The less competitions that these women can perform in, that's prize money that they lose. In fact, the championship that Amani Khalif uh, and Lin Yu Ting were ousted from had a $2.4 million pot. So they they literally missed out on so much money. Caster Semenya, all the races that she wasn't allowed to do. Porsanti Sanjarayan that we talked about uh, with the AIS condition. Like actual money is being lost. And that's just from the races and the opportunities and maybe even uh, coaching opportunities or, or, or future commentating copy. Who knows? Like there's so much that you miss out on when you have all these attacks levied at you. But that includes sponsorships. Nike and whoever else might shy away from working with people who have controversy surrounding them. So there are real consequences. But the one that I find to be the most egregious is that you're then becoming a proponent of subjecting little girls to this very, very intimate testing. As a, the mom of two little girls, I don't subscribe to that. And if you think about the fact that we talked about these like female impersonators and stuff, Dora Ratchin, Heinz Ratchin, she was 17. She was 17 when all this happened, when she was teed up for the Olympics and whatnot. And I think she was 19 when she was finally arrested and whatnot. These are kids. <laughs> 
these are kids that they're doing this stuff to. And not only that, but if you're saying, hey, I want to prove that you're a man or a woman or, or prove that you're actually a female before you compete against other females. It's not like that's just the Olympics. There are college level sports. There are high school and middle school level sports that trans kids are are trying to compete in now. And so it's it's something that absolutely happens to children that they have to deal with being embroiled in, in controversy around their gender as children. It's crazy to me. So um, yeah, if we could stop that, that'd be great. <laughs> but let's talk about gender verification a little bit. And we'll talk about a, a, a just a brief history of what happened. So at some point in history, it, there were weren't any women even allowed to play sports. So there was just the exclusion of women from sporting events. And I put 1896 just because that was the first Olympic Games and it was all male. And they didn't have women until the next one, which was 1900. They had 22 ladies participate. But in 1936, again, with Helen Stevens, they instituted femininity exams. And that consisted of actual visual inspections. In 1946, they instituted having to have certificates of femininity. This is one from 1998 for the Olympic Winter Games. So this lasted for quite a while. In 1960, they incorporated a hirsutism scoring sheet into those certifications. And what hirsutism is, is, is having excess facial and body hair. So just the, think of the indignity of that. <laughs> of that. Oh, gosh. And then in 1966, they made visual genital inspections mandatory. And so they had what they called nude parades because they just had to, you know, show that they were actually the the gender they claimed to be. Horrible, horrible, horrible. So, and they did this the whole time, but they didn't make it mandatory until 1966. And the indignity of that was short lived. So I think people railed against it so much that it only lasted for a couple of years where it was a requirement. And then they instituted what's called the bar body test. And this had issues, particularly for people like Ewa Klobukowska, because she failed a bar body gender verification test. And what a bar body is, it's essentially the inactive X chromosome. So again, females typically have two X chromosomes, but the DNA only actually activates one of them. And the other one is called a bar body. It's an actual little, you can see the little piece of it <laughs> in cells. It's really kind of neat. So, you know, men shouldn't have any bar bodies, right? Because they don't have an inactive X chromosome. But sometimes some people are born with one X chromosome. They call it XO, but it's um, impossible to be born with just a Y chromosome. Those babies don't make it past uh, like a few months gestation. You, you could have XXY chromosomes, which would mean you have Klinefelter syndrome. You have XY like a male, but you have an extra bar body like a woman might. Or you could be XXX female and have two bar bodies. So it just depends. That's what happened to Awa Klobukowska. She failed the test. They redid it a few years after that and, and it was fine but ultimately these tests were faulty on their own but even if they showed things accurately the chromosomal makeup could have indi you know indicated difference that wasn't really there i can appreciate the progression but it still wasn't something that worked well and or worked for everyone so in 1999 that's when they really started to move toward that ad hoc hyperandrogen testing so again hey, you look like a man or we have concerns or accusations that you're a man. We're going to call you out specifically to do this, this additional testing, which again is fucked up. And then in 2003, they instituted guidelines for trans women. But again, those guidelines basically forced trans women to have bottom surgeries that they did not want. So that was pretty terrible. Um, but then in 2016, again, they loosened those requirements and only looked at the testosterone levels and the amount of HRT that they were undergoing. And so that, you know, again, moving forward, things are things are getting a little better, which is good. So I think there's still a long way to go. But ultimately, 
it, it, you know, we're making progress. And so I, I'd love to present reason number six that I think we can absolutely have trans women competing with cis women, especially if we have a bit of a more collaborative way forward. But before we move forward, let's let's go back a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about the history of women in sports. And I, I think we can kind of see that same progression and advancement that we did with, with the loosening of gender verification that we'll see in women in sports history. So let's start way back when with the very first actual Olympics, the one that happened in 776 BC, women were included and women were rock stars. <laughs> there was this woman named Kaniska and she was like a chariot champion, but women were respected and women were allowed to compete. I mean, we can't know the actual ins and outs of things, but for the most part, the fact that they were documented to have participated I think is a wonderful thing. And also uh, it's pretty amazing that then the first Olympics didn't include women trying to say that they were holding to the, the ideals of the original Olympics when that wasn't the case. They, they had women competing. But moving into the Victorian era in the 1830s, women were perceived as fragile and helpless. And a lot of that actually was, you know, the misogyny of the day for sure. But there were just so many outbreaks of tuberculosis around that time that one of the actual beauty ideals that started to surface from the amount of people who had tuberculosis was that femininity meant frailty. It meant paleness. It meant big bulging eyes and having a very nightmare before Christmas kind of look to you. <laughs> Um, and in fact, Edgar Allan Poe's mother had tuberculosis. So he had those same kind of emo looking women in a lot of his work. There was just this whole paradigm of really frail women. But there were a lot of women who, who of course, didn't fit that mold. And luckily, some of the upper class ladies were able to make advances in sports like tennis and golf, which led to then working class women being able to have more athletic pursuits. So in the 1890s, bicycles were all the rage. And that was a whole, I won't get into it, but the history of misogyny is, is terrible. But there was a whole thing about men being afraid for women to ride bicycles because they thought that it would impair their reproductive functions. And that, that, that seems to be what a lot of these excuses for misogyny were about. It was like, oh, if you play too much sports, you won't be able to have children and you 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 won't be able to have, you know, a, a good reproductive system and blah, blah, blah. So it's pretty terrible. But pedestrianism also came out at that time. It's basically like walking. Yeah, so that was big. In 1900, you had the first women's athletic clubs and the first female Olympians. So there were, again, 22 women in, who participated in the Olympics. So now you'll see my little chart here come up and I'm going to start showing the amount of women who are participating in the Olympics as sort of a gauge to see just how much equality is coming into play as we move through time here. <laughs> so 1921, this is such a crazy situation. But the Fédération Sportive Féminine Internationale was a French organization that was started basically to say, hey, you won't let a lot of us women participate in sports, so we're going to make our own thing. And the very next year, they had the very first women's only Olympic Games in Paris, which is really dope. Now, that really set off the IOC and the IAAF. They were butt hurt and lied out of said butts. In other words, they were like, hey, FSFI, if you want to participate in the Olympics, we will add 10 more games just for women as long as you play by the IAAF rules. We'll allow more women into the Olympics. And so they did, but they lied. They only did five additional games. And then they did this whole thing. So in 1928, with with the first instance of these FSFI women participating in the Olympics, they had the very first 800 meter race for women. 
And they tried to make it out like these ladies were so exhausted and oh, they were falling all over themselves. One reporter said, I saw 11 wretched women on the ground after the race panting and laying there. And it was terrible. And that didn't even fucking happen. So <laughs> if, if you look at the actual race, first of all, there were only nine women who ran. They all finished. They tried to say five women didn't even finish. They were so exhausted. Only one woman actually lies down on the ground for a little bit at the end of the race. They tried to say that, oh, they're, they were so, they were so hurt. But it was just like any other race that you've ever seen where one person might lie down for a bit. Everybody else is a little tired, but it is it, just a complete lie. And so they took out the 800 meter race until 1960. <laughs> off the premise that women are just, they get too exhausted. It was terrible. In 1932, we had our first two female gold medalists, and that would be our girl, Babe Didrikson Zaharias and Stella Walsh. <laughs> they were the first gold medalists for the uh, Olympics. And we also had our first two black Olympians participate, Tidy Pickett and Louis Stokes. So that's really awesome. And then we had uh, in 1936 with the Berlin Olympics, where we had that first instance of gender verification testing. And in 1943, there was an All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, which inspired the hit movie A League of Their Own, which is pretty cool. In 1952, the Soviet Union came to the Olympics ready to play. Their women were on point. It was just as many men as women participating and they kicked so much ass. And of course, this was around the time of the Cold War and all the, the Soviet Union communist uh, red scare issues with America. And so, you know, they felt like, OK, we got to step our shit up because they got their women here. We're going to start getting our women to participate a little bit more than we have been. So that was interesting how xenophobia essentially <laughs> led to a little less misogyny. <laughs> so then in 1964, the Civil Rights Act passes, which was supposed to include some gender protections, but it didn't do too, too much for on the gender front. But yeah, it really did address racism. In 1967, Catherine Switzer was the first woman to run in the Boston Marathon, which was up until then, all men only. And in fact, one official didn't like that so much to the point that he <laughs> actually tried to push her out of the race. Have a look at this. So he so he tried to push her. He then was pushed by Catherine's boyfriend. It's pretty scary. Like, look at that. He 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 was pushed away from her. So it looks like really hard on her but that's not her um but you can see the pictures here a little bit better that he really tried to grab her bib and he was like get out of my race let's then talk about the whole it's complicated thing a little bit turns out she forgave him she forgave him for that she said that she understood that he was just a product of his time he actually thought that she was clowning around and making a mockery of it he didn't realize that she had trained so hard to actually do this and that she was intending to compete and win or not win but finish and so in 1979 they actually made up and they had a conversation and I think that's a little photo shoot before she ran that race that Boston Marathon so you know things aren't always as simple as they seem you know and I think it's beautiful that she saw the humanity in him and understood that he's just a it was an old man who thought she was doing it with the wrong intentions. So, you know, we'll give him some grace there. But it's crazy that the, again, that you would treat another adult that way. We're adults. And you would, you, you're you going to go pull and push a, a woman? It, it just makes no sense. But anyway, that happened. And so then in 1972, Title IX of the Education Act passes 
which is meant to specifically address the inequality, especially in college institutions around sports and how women are treated. But unfortunately, it wasn't made mandatory until 1978. So it really didn't result in like bathrooms or, or, or locker rooms being made of similar quality or, or, or some of the different things that impeded women from competing. And then in 1973, we had Billie Jean King win the Battle of the Sexes match against Bobby Riggs. And this was the most watched tennis event of all time. 90 million people tuned in to watch her beat his ass which is awesome there's actually a movie called battle of the sexes about this event which stars emma stone and steve carell so i'll be checking that out soon um moving forward in 1988 flojo came in and wrecked shop the sponsorship she received the world record she shattered she just made so many advances toward the the validity of women being in sport. In 2007, Venus Williams pushed for and received equal pay so that when she, I think the next year, she actually won an open and finally made the exact same pay as uh, the man who won the open, which was great. In 2015, there was actual research that came out that proved disparities in pay and media coverage between men and women. And then in 2020, the WNBA signed an agreement for better pay and benefits, which was awesome. In 2022, there was also an agreement for the U.S. soccer team that was uh, signed for equal pay. And then, of course, we all witnessed in 2023 the FIFA Women's World Cup and how that just was such a case for sports equality. Uh, it was beautiful how the whole world rallied around women we saw that the com the competition level was just as high for women as it is for men. And so it was beautiful to see that coverage. And I think it's even to this day still made a difference. What's neat is that the 2024 Olympics, as you can see, our chart is kind of caught up to full equality here. The 2024 Paris Olympics are projected to be 50-50 men versus women's participation, which is extraordinary. So if we can, you know, keep it at that point, that'd be great. And then I think that better reflects the actual world we live in. So how cool is that? So also let's take a look back at our chart of male versus female sporting advantages. Now we talked about men having strength, speed, and explosive power, and females being more dominant with endurance, flexibility, and balance. But there's an equal playing field in the middle there. And that looks like men and women being at the exact same level when it comes to precision, steadiness, focus, tactics and strategy, animal bonding, techniques, and teamwork. And so what that translates to is that there's all these sports where, yes, men might have an advantage in like weightlifting, sprinting, shot put, things like that. Females would have an advantage with endurance, of course, like marathons, flexibility with gymnastics balance with water dancing things like that um but we it's an even playing field when it comes to sports like shooting archery table tennis fencing equestrian sports diving volleyball so it's one of those things where you know we have these gender segregations that aren't even necessary and also it's beautiful that there are so many mixed teams in the olympics and in sport for like mixed archery, mixed shooting, things like that. So if we can keep that up, mixed tennis, <laughs> you know, if we can keep on that path and keep on that trajectory, I think that would be beautiful. And that goes along with some of the recommendations and ideas that I'd like to throw out there to stoke the spirit of competition and instead of segregation. You've hung in there this long. Thank you so much. It's almost to the end. So make sure you like this video before we get there. Thanks. All right, let's get back to it. And so if we look at like contact and combat sports, yes, I think that we need to address the fact that men and women tend to have high, different levels of testosterone, which may or may not impact their level of strength and, and explosive power. Some of the things where, where males tend to objectively edge out females 
then yeah, I think we absolutely need to identify that, but perhaps we can segregate our teams or our sports in different ways that don't rely on solely saying you're a man or a woman. So maybe there are different metrics we could look at, like power or BMI, like you have featherweight, lightweight, you know, heavyweight in boxing. Maybe those could be, um, you know, adjusted per testosterone level or BMI or something like that to accommodate for power differentials with men and women. I don't know where that's really done well is with the Paralympics and how they actually have so many differentiations based on the body that is competing in said sport. And so have a look at this. I'm going to overlay the ways that they identify different abilities and bodies and capabilities and disabilities. That could be a really good model for perhaps how we move forward with classifications of different sports. I also feel like we could apply the same testing measures on everybody privately like ahead of time. So you're not in the middle of a competition before somebody comes and tells you that you actually have XY chromosomes, which you might not have ever known. (laughs) So now you have to receive not only this crazy new information about yourself, but the whole world has to hear about it. That's just not fair. So perhaps if everyone, men and women, have automatic testosterone testing for contact and combat sports, then if there are these anomalies, people can address those on a case-by-case basis and say, hi, it looks like you have a high level of androgen insensitivity, so we don't need to do anything even though you have high testosterone or, you know, you actually have um, testes, so we're going to want you to undergo HRT to compete alongside other women or whatever the case is. That can all be done in private. And then that could actually fall under, especially for Americans, like HIPAA laws, where where it's it's nobody else's business and it doesn't have to come out that somebody had a a ward removed or a world record expunged because they turned it turned out that they had different chromosomes later or something like that. So I just think there's there's so much we can do to again classify sports in a different way and segregate sports differently to accommodate for some of those differences that we actually have objectively, but that if we are to then move forward with looking at those objective differences via testosterone, that that should be tested for everybody. And then that might be the way that we classify (laughs) these sports. Like if you're at a certain level testosterone Maybe you can be in these different categories. Who knows? That might be getting a little too weird, but I don't know what the solution is. I just think that there is something better than what we're doing right now that ostracizes women and also makes it out that we are a lesser sex. And that's just not the case for strength and speed sports like racing and swimming. I think we could, again, do the same thing where we separate tiers Um, in divisions by perhaps time or amount lifted or things like that. But, you know, again, I I just, I genuinely don't know. I feel like that's something that could be discussed and workshopped (laughs) with people who are in these different sports more than me, like a layman on the outside of things. But I just feel like for like weightlifting in particular, why not classify how much you can lift by being a heavyweight, featherweight, lightweight, bantamweight, you know, all those different things. Why does that not apply to weightlifting categories as opposed to just boxing? You know, I don't, I, I don't know. I have no idea, but, but there's got to be a better way to segregate sports where people aren't touching each other. There's no contact. There's no, there's no soccer ball in play or rugby ball in play. Like, you know, what does it matter that they compete together? Why don't they just have different metrics for how they determine who wins? So anyway, that's that's a thought for strength and speed sports. I also feel like we could have way more mixed teams, like co-ed teams, like for I think flag football is going to be in the Olympics next time. And that would be an amazing time to have a mixed team, which is done collegiately all the time. We could have mixed basketball teams, mixed soccer teams, I don't know. But there's a lot a lot more that we can do with mixing team sports and mixing individual sports like archery, like we already do, shooting like we already do, and apply that to even more more realms. 
And then for all other sports, let's just remove the gender segregation altogether. <laughs> like chess and billiards, like why? <laughs> it just makes no sense. I don't know all the answers, but I just think that we need to keep asking the questions. So that's why ultimately I feel like it's perfectly fine for trans women, especially transsexual women, to compete in sports with cis women. If it's not a contact com or combat sport, I, I don't care if you're transgender in name only and, and haven't done HRT or anything like that. I think it's absolutely fine to compete with with the gender that you identify with. Um, so I hope I've given solid reasoning as to why that's the case. So just to wrap things up, in conclusion, and this is my sort of summary of, of my thoughts and points. So if, if you didn't watch any of this, then this is the short answer to my response. But yeah, I feel like all women, cis or trans, should be able to play whatever sport they want to. If trans women want to play sports that rely on some of the things that they benefited from as a male, that they should do the work to make their bodies align with the sex that they're participating with. So, you know, uh, co again, contact and combat sports uh, and things like that should certainly have some sort of uh, uh, an eyeball on the testosterone levels that that they have. And so in my last slide, I know I talked about some kind of pie in the sky things that we could potentially do, but even under the current system, if we are to do testosterone testing, we should just do it for everybody, especially for sports, again, that rely on contact and combat. I think we should develop considerate and private protocols for people who fall outside of the range that's acceptable for being a female if you're testing for testosterone. And I also think that some of the thresholds that are afforded to trans women should be afforded to cis women with hyperandrogenism. So again, that, that lower purple end of the spectrum is basically for cis women or XY genotypic, but uh, phenotypic females who have high testosterone, but you can have up to twice that amount if you're a trans woman. So I think that they should just up that threshold for all women, for all phenotypic women. And so again, that's, that's my argument. That's my case. Now that you've heard everything, <laughs> if you still feel that women should be separated and that trans women can't compete in sports and that Amani Khalif and Lin Yu Ting are men, you know, like, please, please, please have a look inward. <laughs> you might just be a bigot. You might just be a transphobe. You might just be a misogynist. And, and if you are, you got to own that. You got to have some self-reflection. And I know you want to be a good person. That's why you probably listen to all this to try to, you know, to, to understand the argument better. And I applaud you for that. But if you are still of the mindset that, again, trans women aren't women and don't have the rights to, to compete, or again, that all the stuff you've been hearing in the media and from these turfs and white knights is real, then, you know, please, please, please just, just bow out of the conversation <laughs> and have a little introspection, please, please, please. Because again, transphobia hurts every woman. It hurts everybody. And it's just mean. And we don't need that energy in this world. We don't need to have people who are absolutely identifying as women be told that they look like a dude. Like, that's just not nice. So again, now that you've heard everything, I'm hoping that you've moved into the it's complicated side of things or either that you've accepted my uh, argument that yes, trans women have every right to compete and that what happened with Amani Khalif and Lin Yu Ting was uh, deplorable. And uh, I, I hope that those ladies sue the ever living shit out of every single person who called them men. And I'm really happy to see that 
it looks like Amani Khalif actually has instituted a lawsuit against JK Rowling and Elon Musk. And maybe I think Donald Trump's included in that and good for her. Good for her. And so that's my, <laughs> that's my case. I hope I've made it well. I have so many citations. I have 126 unique sources that I've pulled from and I will do a quick screenshot of all of these. But if you want to have a link to them directly, go to withsophie.co slash links to click on my citation list. It's extensive and it is separated out by topic. So hopefully that's helpful. But yeah, this was an undertaking <laughs> and a half. So <laughs> thank you for having a listen. And if you also would like to ask a question and you want a well-researched and thought out response to your question, it could be about anything, literally anything. Today, we talked about uh, trans women in sports. I'm not a sports person, so I definitely had to do a little bit more homework than your average Joe or somebody who knows anything about sports. But that that's my job. I mean, that's what I'm here for. So uh, our last question was on sex and chronic illness. So if you have any questions related to sex, sexuality, health, anything I can research for you, put me to work. I'm, I'm happy to do it. Um, our next question is going to be a little bit more risque. <laughs> We're going to be talking about penetrative orgasms. And so keep an eye out for that response. And then we have uh, quite a few coming up. We have a bit of a, a, a cue. So, you know, I might not get to it next, but definitely go to withsophie.co slash ask Sophie and submit your own questions. Um, you can do it via video, audio, or just typing in a text question. Or honestly, if just like Matt did on Facebook, if you want to ask me a question via social media, feel free to do that. But ultimately, all of this is in service of my sexwithsophie.com website. You can also get to it by going to withsophie.co. That's a collection of resources that are intended to help people understand sexuality and sex better and also to build community around sex and sexuality. So I hope you will join me and become a member for free at sexwithsophie.com. And then we have some paid plans if you want to avail yourself of some of our more fun features like our podcast exclusive features. And we also have a really fun <laughs> program called guided masturbations, which I am um, very proud of. And we have a lot more coming out for that soon. But yeah, it's been several hours. <laughs> and so I'm sure you're wanting to go. But again, follow, subscribe. If you're looking at this in the forum, make sure you leave some comments. And again, don't forget to put cornholio in a timestamp for anybody who's coming out the side of their face. <laughs> Thank you all for your time and attention. This is Sophie signing out. Bye.